this is the last lecture in this uh, course. So what we will do is we will quickly recall what we uh, did in this course and briefly discuss a couple of directions in which we can uh, move forward. So when we started this course, these were the topics which were proposed to be covered. Uh, the approximate methods and finite element method, dynamics of truss and planar frames, damping models and analysis of equilibrium equations, dynamics of grids and 3D frames and some computational aspects like solution of equilibrium equations, eigenvalue problems, model reduction and substructuring. Then uh, review of dynamic stiffness matrix and transfer matrix methods. Then dynamics of plane stress, strain, plane strain, plate bending, shell and 3D elements. Then applications to earthquake engineering and vehicle structure interactions. Then application of finite element analysis for uh, elastic stability problems. Some issues about treatment of nonlinearity and questions on finite element model updating and how a finite element method is used in hybrid simulations. So accepting the last topic, uh, we have broadly covered all these uh, issues. Uh, so the course has been divided into basically 11 modules. Uh, in the first module, we started with approximate methods and finite element method. Then this was followed by analysis of uh, planar trusses and frames. Then we spent time on uh, integration of equations of motion. Then analysis of grids and three-dimensional three frames. Then time integration of equation of motion. In the th third uh, module, we considered uh, um, again normal mode uh, representations. Here we looked at time integration. Then questions on model reduction and substructuring were addressed in mod uh, module 6. Then analysis of two and three dimensional uh, continua. We spent some time discussing uh, plane stress pl elements, plate bending elements and facet shell elements. So that uh, covered the module 7 and 8. And in module 9, we uh, covered uh, quite a bit of ground on structural stability analysis. Then we briefly considered two topics that is finite element model updating and how to deal with nonlinearity in finite element models. So uh, I would like to acknowledge, my, acknowledge uh, at this stage uh, authors of these books uh, whose work I found quite useful in preparing these uh, lectures. Uh, so at many places I have uh, my lectures were fashioned after some of the coverage, uh, coverage in some of these textbooks. So we began by considering uh, application of Hamilton's principle to simple systems like mass spring dashpot system and we derived the equation of motion by applying Hamilton's principle and then generalize this to continuous systems. So this is actually vibrating rod and we saw that application of uh, Hamilton's principle enables us to derive the equilibrium equation and also a set of valid boundary conditions. Now the boundary conditions themselves were classified as geometric, forced or kinematic conditions uh, and then natural boundary conditions. We covered several examples where there was combination of continuum elements and discrete elements, used uh, Hamilton's principle and derived the equations. We then moved on to uh, theory of Euler Bernoulli beams. Again, by using the Hamilton's principle, we derived the governing equation and uh, the relevant boundary conditions and we saw that um, the boundary can, uh, the field equation will be of this form in free vibration and there are 16 combinations of single span beams which, which emanate from the application of Hamilton's principle. So these are various boundary conditions which are appropriate for uh, Euler Bernoulli uh, beam cases. Now in the analysis of uh, free vibration characteristics, uh, we began by discussing about Rayleigh's quotient. So we formulated the Rayleigh's quotient for discrete multi-degree freedom system and few continuous systems and an important property of Rayleigh's quotient was that it was bounded between square of first natural frequency and square of the nth natural frequency in a n degree freedom system. Whereas for continuous system, there was only a bound on the lower value, uh, r was greater than omega 1 square. Now Rayleigh's quotient uh, you can derive without writing the equation of motion. So that is a, a quick way of finding natural frequencies and uh, um, phi of x are the trial functions and the choice of these trial functions plays important role in application of these methods and among different choices of trial functions, the one which provides the lowest value of Rayleigh's quotient uh, 
provides the best estimate to the first natural frequency. So, in our endeavor to lower the uh, value of Rayleigh's quotient, uh, we introduced the Rayleigh Ritz method where the trial function was represented in a series of uh, orthogonal functions typically and uh, ANs were the generalized coordinates and we minimize Rayleigh's quotient with respect to these ANs. So, this phi n of x are a set of le uh, known linearly independent function which satisfy all the boundary conditions to start with. Then we uh, found out uh, ANs which minimize this Rayleigh's quotient and uh, that helped us to find not only the first natural frequency but also approximations to higher natural frequencies. Then starting from field equations, we developed the so called method of weighted residuals. So, for example, for the beam equation, this was a field equation and we started by approximating the uh, solution over 0 to L in terms of n uh, generalized coordinates a n of t to be determined and a set of known trial functions phi n of x. So, these phi n of x are valid over the entire domain of the beam. So, when we substitute this into the field equation, uh, we get an error that we call as residue and the method of weighted residual essentially minimizes this residue in some sense. So, that leads to a set of discrete equations uh, that is the space variable x has been now discretized and we are left with time which is still continuous. So, this is a semi discretized equation of motion for the system and this leads to the concept of mass, damping and stiffness matrix and a forcing vector. So, what, the, what uh, method of weighted residual uh, achieves is that a partial differential equation governing the behavior of a continuous system has been replaced by an equivalent set of ordinary differential equations which are initial value problems with a view to obtain approximate solutions. The notion of this method of weighted residuals uh, was not unique and there were several possibilities uh, and we talked about least square method, collocation method, Galerkin method, subdomain collocation, petrov galerkin and so on and so forth. The basic idea here is the weighting function changes for uh, these different methods. And we also applied this to a few problems and saw how it works. So, basically there was a residue and a weight function uh, and uh, by equating, selecting n weight functions uh, and equating this to 0, we got uh, n number of uh, equations and this is the resulting equation. This is broadly the uh, class of methods known as method of weighted residues. We also considered certain other additional uh, methods and uh, we introduced the strong form, weighted residual form and weak form of governing equations while discussing this. Now, the problem with uh, uh, method of weighted residuals as discussed here is that these trial functions uh, were globally valid. So, if we have a, a very more complicated domain to construct phi n of x which are globally valid will be difficult and also the generalized coordinates a n of t that arises here do not have a direct physical meaning. Now, this led to uh, the discussion on finite element method. What we did was the domain of interest was uh, partitioned as shown here and the field variable at these points known as nodes were taken as generalized coordinates and these subdomains which are known as elements, the field variable within an element was interpolated in terms of these nodal values using polynomials. So, each of uh, these elements have for example, have simple uh, four uh, unknowns and a interpolation function. So, there is nothing really superlative about the performance of a single element, but the entire finite element procedure is such that when all this is assembled. Uh, it delivers a very superlative performance in terms of analysis of uh, very complex problems involving complexity in geometry, constitutive laws and so on and so forth. Now, <coughs> the word finite element, the phrase finite element method, we try to explain the word finite uh, here uh, originates uh, uh, because the field variable is approximated in terms of the value of the field variables at a set of nodes finite number of nodes that is where the word finite arises. The element uh, of course is that we are uh, the domain of interest uh, uh, is approximated by omega tilde and this is taken as union of a set of uh, you know non intersecting subdomains and each one is an element uh, 
uh, and within an element the field variable is approximated in terms of interpolation function and nodal values. So this uh, renders uh, credence to the name element. The method is of course uh, it indicates that finite element method is an approximate numerical method to obtain solutions to par partial differential equations or variational problems. So these omega i are elements xi tilde are nodes and capital N is a uh, number of nodes in the uh, system uh, in the uh, approximated model. Now using that we what we did was for each of these elements we derived the equation of motion that led to the notion of element level mass damping and stiffness matrix and a forcing vector and this is formulated in the local coordinate system. Then the element level equation of motion is transformed to global coordinate systems. We developed how uh, displacement uh, uh, velocity a and acceleration and force force vectors are all vectors and they obey certain rules of transformation and based on that we can construct the uh, transformation needed to form the mass stiffness and damping matrices in the global coordinate system. Then uh, to construct the structure uh, matrix for the entire structure we these matrices need to be assembled. So basically energies in different subdomains add and uh, that forms the basis of forming uh, the global equation of motion and at this stage we have not yet uh, uh, you know partitioned the equation into unknown displacements and unknown reactions and we have not yet imposed the boundary conditions. So upon imp uh, imposing the boundary conditions uh, and partitioning the vector u uh, accordingly we got the final equation of motion for the system for the unknown displacements as mu double dot plus u dot plus ku equal to f of t where u of 0 is u0 and u dot 0 is u0 dot which are initial displacement and velocities. We considered various complicating issues. We started by studying planar frames and modeled elements as Euler Bernoulli beams. We considered questions about how to deal with a hinge and a roller on an inclined support etc. That is how to set up suitable constraint equations in uh, terms of degrees of freedom to correctly capture the presence of a hinge or an inclined roller and so on and so forth. One important observation we made was that while the displacement field across the element is continuous but when it comes to evaluation of stresses for example in the case of an actually vibrating bar there will be discontinuities. So the finite element method thus introduces discontinuities across element boundaries in, in certain quantities uh, which are not, uh, not there is no discontinuity in an exact solution. So this is one of the limitations of finite element method. Next we started looking at some issues about dynamics. So we derived the input output relation in time and frequency domains. We introduced the notion of a impulse response function and complex frequency response function. These quantities become matrices uh, for multi degree freedom systems and these are the definitions for the impulse response function and the complex frequency response function. Now in formulating the um, in, in trying to solve the governing equations of motion we started by looking for certain coordinates in which the degrees of freedom become uncoupled and we uh, found that there are transformations from a given uh, coordinate system to certain natural coordinate systems in which the degrees of freedom become uncoupled. The consequence of that is a coupled set of ordinary differential equations are solved as a set of uncoupled uh, either second order differential equation or first order differential equation depending on how we represent the equation of motion. So we started uh, another element uh, in our um, solution strategy modeling strategy was introduction of damping. For linear systems the damping models were either viscous or structural and so called classical or non-classical. So the classical damping models are those in which the undamped uh, normal modes uncouple the equation of motion whereas that is not true for non-classical damping. So we addressed uh, uh, you know question of how to uncouple equation of motion for each one of these four damping uh, models and uh, we introduce in doing so several quantities like receptance, mobility, accelerance, dynamic stiffness, mechanical impedance, apparent mass and so on and so forth. So uh, the FRF calculations that is the representation of uh, system response in frequency domain uh, we developed several methods uh, for example in viscously damped system one could directly invert the dynamic stiffness matrix and get that uh, 
and similar strategy can also be uh, adopted for structurally damped systems. Uh, but, but each one of this calculation can be carried out in terms of more, su uh, more superposition method by using more superposition method and that requires the determination of the appropriate uh, natural frequencies and mode shapes. So this we did for uh, all the uh, four cases of damping uh, that is structural, viscous, proportional and non-proportional damping models. In certain class of problems in linear structural dynamics where attention, if attention is focused only on steady state behavior under harmonic loads or loads which permit a Fourier representation, one can use what method known as dynamic stiffness matrix. Here we assume that in a beam for example shown here, this is an Euler Bernoulli beam, uh, if the nodal displacement and forces are all harmonic at the same frequency as shown here, what conditions these amplitudes delta k and pk should satisfy so that uh, the governing equation is satisfied. So that leads us to the definition of uh, the dynamic stiffness matrix that we derived for Euler Bernoulli beam uh, and we also considered alternative representation in terms of transfer matrices briefly and uh, to do that we introduced for example in actually vibrating rod a state vector comprising of displacement and actual force and how it is related from uh, at this node uh, the amplitude and displacement of uh, amplitude and, uh, of force and displacement how they are related to amplitude of uh, force and displacement at the other node. So this is so called transfer matrix. So this was this can also be derived for uh, actually vibrating bar as well as uh, beam and other more general problems. Then we moved on to analysis of certain built up structures, a planar frame like this or a grid structure like this or in more general situations a three dimensional frame. So to analyze uh, a grid element. Uh, uh, which is displayed here, uh, bending in uh, these beams cause torsion in the other beams. So uh, we need to include effect of uh, twisting and that we spent some time and developed the uh, um, uh, stiffness matrix associated with torsional degrees of freedom and we developed the relevant structural matrices that included the flexure and uh, twisting. This we generalized to three dimensional beam element and here we considered U uh, beam element typically has two nodes and six degrees of freedom per node. The degrees of freedom are uh, translation in x direction that is axial deformation and uh, rotations uh, uh, about z axis uh, and about y axis at the two nodes. So and of course translations uh, here. So uh, this we developed and the way we uh, approached the problem was we assumed that cross sections have a symmetric. Uh, uh, properties and we set up the expression for axial deformation, twisting, bending about z and bending about y uh, where for uh, twisting we use the theory of uh, you know torsion of uh, prismatic members which we developed in some detail as we uh, went along. The kinetic energy itself comprised of axial deformation, twisting, bending about z and bending about y. In later discussions we also introduced uh, uh, strain energy due to shear deformation and kinetic energy due to rotary inertia that led to the treatment of deep beams. Now for all these class of systems uh, uh, that is fairly broad class of systems the final equation of motion always had uh, this form. Uh, we for, a disc for the purpose of discussing numerical methods for solving these equations we introduced the nonlinear terms. Uh, with an anticipation that this we will be dealing with later in the course. So we developed several methods for numerical integration of these equations. These equations at this stage are semi discretized that means time is still continuous the spatial variables have been discretized. So the basic idea was to replace the time variation in time uh, again by discretizing time. So we considered solution of this equation at a set of discrete time instant t0, t1, t2, tn with some step size delta Tn, Tn plus 1 minus Tn. The basic idea was to replace the derivatives appearing in these equations by suitable finite difference approximations and convert these equations into appropriate algebraic equations and treat their solution using algebraic methods. So we discussed several methods, uh, forward Euler, backward Euler, central difference and Newmark's family of methods and the so called HST alpha method and the generalization and uh, HST alpha with operator splitting. We discussed questions about explicitness of these algorithms and what is implicit and explicit algorithms so on and so forth. Uh, 
uh, we also discussed uh, for uh, linear time invariant systems uh, the question of spectral radius uh, and how it influences choice of step size uh, that would mean how to select step size so that uh, the solutions would be stable. In discussing this we uh, identified certain desirable features for numerical integration schemes uh, that, that, is, uh, that, need, that, that we need to use in dealing with large scale problems. The algorithm should have at least second order accuracy, they should be unconditionally stable when applied to linear time invariant systems, then there should be controllable algorithmic damping in higher modes uh, which would require us to investigate the spectral radius as frequency becomes large and frequency becomes small. There should be no overshoot that is excessive oscillations during first few steps should not be there and the solution should be self starting and no more than one set of implicit equations to be no solved at each step. So, we illustrated some of these requirements with specific methods. Next we considered questions, uh, two questions on uh, dealing with large scale problems. The first question uh, was on model reduction. That means suppose if you have a large scale finite element model such as this, how can we reduce it to a model with lesser degrees of freedom? This arises, uh, originally this type of questions were asked in the context of uh, uh, you know when computational resources were limited, uh, but presently this, those questions are probably not that uh, relevant, but what is still relevant is uh, when we deal with situations where we are comparing uh, the performance of a computational model with an experimental model and we are trying to uh, reconcile the two models, then it ne we need to reduce the uh, for example, typically the size of computational model to match the degree of freedoms that are measured in an experimental work. So, the experimental degrees of freedom typically tend to be small uh, than the computational model. So, either we can reduce the size of the computational model or expand the size of an experimental model. So, that requires certain computational procedures and we discussed uh, uh, three methods study condensation, dynamic condensation and system equivalent reduction and expansion process. We saw that this SEIRP method is the most versatile, it preserves a set of uh, normal modes in the reduced model, whereas in a static condensation uh, there is no such promise, not even one mode need to be correctly captured, uh, whereas in dynamic condensation it is possible to capture at least one mode correctly. Next we considered situation where uh, again a structure made up of different components and the question was suppose these different components for example, as in a satellite structure if are being designed and developed by different teams, uh, how do we uh, produce a finite element model for the combined system. So, here we discussed two class of methods that is spatial coupling method and modal coupling method. That uh, in discussing the modal coupling method, uh, we discussed the component mode synthesis which is one of the well known coupling techniques which that is used in practice. After the foray into certain computational aspect, we return to the question of uh, element development and we moved on to two dimensional elements. Uh, we considered the membrane action due to in plane loads and bending action due to transverse loads. So, we began by discussing membrane action, we developed linear triangular plane stress element uh, and uh, we generalized it to linear quadrilateral element and that led to the notion of isoparametric formulation uh, which basically uh, you know <coughs> uh, was necessitated by new requirement to integrate uh, these integrals that appear in the formulation of element stiffness and mass matrices. So, the idea is the geometry of the structure is mapped to a, a master element like this and we interpolate the coordinates in this uh, x and y in terms of psi and eta using the same trial functions as is used to represent the field variables, displacement field variables. So, uh, this transformation uh, was essentially made to facilitate evaluation of the integral leading to the determination of stiffness mass and forcing, uh, stiffness and mass matrices and the forcing vectors. We moved on to the discussion of solid elements, we considered tetrahedron element, rectangular hexahedron element pentahedron, isoparametric hexahedron elements and we developed some of these formulations uh, and uh, we discussed I think 8 noded element with 3 degrees of freedom per node uh, an isoparametric formulation how this can be done. 
Next we considered problems where uh, there was um, axis symmetry in the geometry uh, that means geometry was 3D axis symmetric solid it is not the object is not necessarily prismatic and not, it is not necessarily thin or thick as in the case of plane stress plane strain models. There were certain restrictions that were pl placed on surface tractions and body forces and that uh, under certain uh, uh, assumptions on these variations uh, this type of problems can also be reduced to two dimensional problems and we formulated one such element. Next we considered uh, plate bending problems and we developed several plate bending elements. We saw the question of uh, how certain element formulations lead to non-conforming uh, you know non-conformity and uh, how to overcome that we discussed several of uh, those strategies. Then we also discussed how to deal with plates that are stiffened by beam elements. So we developed elements for uh, dealing with this type of situations. So uh, at the end of these lectures we were ready with uh, stiffness and mass matrices and damping matrices and forcing vector for a wide class of problems uh, and next we moved on to questions about stability analysis. The question of stability was addressed with respect to either a steady state of rest or periodic motion or random motion. We can address in this form we considered state of rest and periodic motion we did not consider random motion in these lectures in these lectures. So the question we asked was what is the influence of an externally imposed disturbance on these states of rest and periodic motion. If as a consequence of this disturbance uh, if the response dies the disturbance dies off then we say that the state is stable uh, then <coughs> if the original state is not restored the two possibilities is motion grows without limit and the state is unstable or if motion neither grows nor decays then we reach a stage where we will not be able to resolve using the first order approximation whether the state is stable or unstable. This type of questions we began by addressing uh, in context of uh, beam columns and uh, for beams carrying axial loads we notice that there is a dramatic change in the nature of the solution. For example if we consider this problem where there is a single span beam uh, carrying a transverse load Q of X and axial load P while writing the expression for bending moment at this cross section. Uh, we were able to write the bending moment due to uh, you know Q of X but when it came to question of writing the expression for bending moment due to P uh, we used the deformed configuration of the beam. So this was our first taste of issue of nonlinearities where to find bending moment M of X we use undeformed geometry whereas to find the contribution from axial load we use a deformed geometry. So that played a crucial role and we saw that the presence of an axial load plays a crucial uh, drama produces dramatic effect and uh, some basic notions like principle of superposition uh, become uh, they become the first casualty in uh, uh, treatment of uh, axial loads. So we recalled some results on uh, beam columns and uh, uh, for example this uh, single span beam carrying a load Q and axial load P we derived the expression for uh, mid span displacement and uh, rotations at the supports and maximum bending moment when load was applied symmetrically and we showed that these responses typically had a structure where delta naught, theta naught and m naught were responses with p equal to 0. When the actual loads were absent whatever was the response they got magnified or uh, modified by certain functions known as stability functions. Uh, so we introduced chi of u, epsilon u, xi of u and the, this graph shows typical plots of these stability functions and the most interesting aspect of these functions is that uh, at certain values of load parameter, actual load parameter uh, these modifications uh, become unbounded thereby indicating that at these values of actual loads the structure would not be stable. So we considered, uh, <coughs> we interpreted presence of a transverse load or our uh, inability to apply axial loads in a truly perfect manner or presence of an initial imperfection as manifestations of certain imperfections in the system. That means these three problems uh, we showed that they are all mathematically equivalent and we uh, uh, interpreted them as manifestations of departures from an ideal situation. Now 
how about the study of an ideal situation itself that led to the uh, notion of an eigenvalue problem to determine the low value of axial load p at which the uh, neighboring equili equilibrium position becomes possible. So this uh, led to the notion of Eulerian buckling loads and uh, we developed that theory. Then we briefly considered question of stability of dynamical systems because we also asked the question on uh, equilibrium of uh, systems in motion. So uh, we considered differential equations of this form and we defined the notion of equilibrium points where x dot and y dot are 0 and we investigated the influence of small perturbations uh, on these equilibrium positions and we found that the nature of the equilibrium points also known as fixed point depend on eigenvalues of this gradient matrix uh, when it is evaluated around these fixed points. Next we uh, enunciated two axioms uh, for analyzing stability of more, uh, more general class of problems and uh, these axioms led to the energy methods for stability analysis. The first axiom stated that a stationary value of the total potential energy with respect to generalized coordinates is necessary and sufficient condition for the equilibrium of the system. So the first axiom provided the condition for equilibrium. The second axiom helped us to establish whether that equilibrium position is stable or not. A complete relative minimum of the total potential energy with respect to generalized coordinates is necessary and sufficient for the stability of an equilibrium state of the system. Now based on this we uh, analyzed several problems. Uh, we considered speci specifically two problems. One is buckling of an uh, euler bernoulli beam and we derived this load deflection diagram uh, of P versus this transverse displacement delta and we trace the, the load deflection paths uh, lose their stability at certain points and they bifurcate. Uh, that is one aspect of it. In uh, structures such as this which are uh, you know um, shell structures can be thought of as something being similar to this type of structure. Suppose there are two rigid links supported as shown here and there is a load P and we start loading this structure uh, that is at theta equal to 0, I mean P equal to 0, we have initially some di uh, displacement and as we go on increasing this, the loading path, in, uh, the, the load and the displacement increase simultaneously and they reach a critical value here at which the structure loses stability and moves to a far away equilibrium position. So this type of behavior is known as limit load buckling. That means when the structure loses stability, the equilibrium position is far away from the position at which it lost its stability. Whereas here, uh, when P approaches P critical, a neighboring equilibrium position becomes possible. Now to formulate uh, the problems of stability uh, using finite element method, uh, we developed what is known as geometric stiffness matrix uh, for uh, different elements and a general theory for that required us to introduce the nonlinear relationship between um, uh, displacements and strains. So a pre-stress that exists uh, uh, does work on uh, the subsequent deformations and that helps us to formulate the uh, geometric stiffness matrix and we showed that the um, an eigenvalue analysis of the elastic stiffness matrix and the geometric stiffness matrix that means kx equal to k sigma uh, lambda k sigma x uh, helped us to determine the loads at which the structure would lose stability. Now another important question we addressed was the interaction between nonlinearity and imperfections. So to illustrate that we considered three archetypal problems. Uh, here in, all, in these three problems AB is a rigid bar. Uh, which is identical in all these three cases but supported in three different ways. Here it is supported through a spring here, here it is supported through a spring here whereas here it is supported through an inclined spring. Conceptually we thought of, th did a thought experiment in which we designed this uh, values of, we selected K1, K2, K3 so that all these three systems had the same value of critical load. But uh, we plotted the load deflection diagram for each one of this. And for this case we found that uh, the load deflection path rises along a stable path and it continues to evolve along a stable path without encountering an unstable path. Now we also introduced in each of these cases slight imperfections and investigated the influence of these imperfections. In the second case 
uh, with a system with a slight imperfection, the load uh, rises, load deflection path rises on a stable path and it encounters an unstable path and the structure loses stability. So here the influence of imperfection is to lower the load carrying capacity of the structure. And this, kept, this in the final uh, 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 case, the similar behavior is observed and the, uh, again a stable path culminates in a uh, unstable, uh, you know, it encounters an unstable trajectory. So in an experimental work, uh, what happens is although these three systems are designed to have the same critical value, it is observed that this is the critical load evaluated for the third system will be less than uh, what is evaluated for the second system and this will be less than what is evaluated for this system. So these two systems are known as imperfection sensitive structures where the critical carry load carrying capacity depends on imperfection and plates and shells display this type of behavior. We considered subsequently another class of problems where the axial loads were time varying. We uh, consider two situations where there is a tall stack under biaxial earthquake ground motion and also a bridge structure which is traversed by a vehicle. So we formulated equation for these two systems and showed that the coefficients in the governing partial differential equations are time dependent. So such systems are known as parametrically excited systems. We also considered uh, another class of problems wherein uh, the, the loads were not time dependent but the direction of the load uh, in the one case for example if the load P uh, its direction does not change during process of deformation a static analysis would tell us how the structure behaves. But if the load were to be such that uh, it remains tangential to the deformed axis a static analysis reveals that this structure is always stable but a dynamic analysis shows that there is a finite value for P beyond which the structure becomes unstable which is uh, consistent with what we uh, anticipate. So these two cases parametrically excited system and the so called follower force models indicated situations under which a dynamic analysis needs to be done to infer stability of the system. Now in, the, in this context we consider three problems. Uh, first one was how to characterize resonances in systems governed by equations of this form where the mass, damping and stiffness matrices are time dependent and especially when these time variations are periodic. Next how to arrive at finite element models for partial differential equations with time varying coefficients. Subsequently uh, are there we also consider the question uh, if there are any situations in statically loaded systems wherein one needs to use dynamic analysis to infer stability conditions. So the in a, while answering the first question we developed the theory of uh, flow case uh, coefficients and uh, we developed a procedure on how to evaluate the flow case matrix and we showed the eigenvalues of the flow case matrix enable us to answer these questions. So uh, to answer the second type of uh, deal with second type of problems we considered a uh, beam carrying a single moving single degree freedom system and we formulated the governing equation and developed a finite element model based on weak formulation and showed that the element mass matrix, damping matrix and stiffness matrices are unsymmetric and time dependent for this class of problems. The interaction between the vehicle and the structure induces these unusual features. So this type of problems need to be handled only in time, uh, they, they do not have natural coordinates, the concept of natural frequency mode shapes are no longer valid. We briefly then considered questions on um, the role of finite element modeling in dealing with existing structures. So before a structure comes into existence we have only mathematical models to uh, deal with uh, that type of uh, problems that is a typically what we do when we design a structure which is yet to come into existence. Moment the structure comes into existence. Uh, we, we uh, of course the mathematical modeling techniques still remain valid but also additionally we have uh, experimental tools becoming available to us and thus we can measure the performance of the uh, structure under either diagnostic loads or operational loads. So the prediction in these situations from an experimental model and a mathematical model often do not agree and the question is how do we update the mathematical model to reconcile these two predictions. So this leads to the topic of finite element model updating and we briefly reviewed the issues uh, related to this question and um, 
developed specifically one approach that was based on so called inverse sensitivity analysis. So, we derived the updating equations in terms of changes to be made to the system parameters uh, based on uh, observed changes in certain system responses and these we showed is connected through a matrix known as sensitivity matrix. So, we carry we considered several issues here uh, how to formulate this S matrix uh, and uh, how to this equa the resulting equations will be often a set of over determined equations that require special techniques to uh, solve them. Uh, we, we discussed pseudo inverse method, singular value decomposition and Tikhonov regularization uh, approaches for uh, dealing with this class of problems. In the final uh, part of our course, we started talking about how to deal with uh, you know non-linearity. So, the sources of non-linearity we identified were either related to non-linear strain displacement relations in which case we said the non-linearity is geometric non-linearity or the relationship between stress and strain could be non-linear. Then we call this a non-linear constitutive, I mean here we had non-linear constitutive laws and this type of non-linearity was called material non-linearity. Then non-linearity associated with boundary conditions as in contact problems or uh, free plays and so on and so forth uh, induces a in, in different kind of non-linearity. The energy dissipation mechanisms also uh, bring in newer forms of non-linearity. It could be friction, uh, it could be impacting at uh, uh, you know free plays, etc. Now, while formulating this, we we can conceptualize different frameworks. For example, uh, the dis displacement and rotation of a structure could be small, but the stress-strain relationship relationship could be non-linear. So this is small deformation, but materially non-linear. Geometrically linear, materially non-linear. Here, the material could be linear or non-linear, but there are large rotations and small strains. So one of the questions. Uh, that needs to be carefully addressed in dealing with non-linear problems is treatment of rotations. So, in a more general class of problems of course, material could be linear or non-linear, there are large rotations and large strains, these are the most general class of problems which are most difficult to deal with. A simple illustration of a non-linear problem with non-linear boundary condition is shown here. Suppose this support, uh, there is a free play, uh, this gap and as the structure deforms, if this gap is negotiated then this spring stiffness will come into action and the stress strain uh, you know typical stress strain plot will have this kind of feature. Here the loading and unloading path will trace each other, this is a geometric nonlinearity. whereas if you are dealing with material nonlinearity, the loading and unloading paths will be different. Upon removal of the load there will be a permanent set. So in dynamical systems uh, we saw that the Gauni equation will be of the form mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx and a non-linear function of instantaneous values of displacement and velocity and this is the geometric non-linearity or uh, 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 elastically non-linear system behavior whereas this one the second term the force of resistance depends on entire time history of the response up to the current time instant. So, this is hereditary or memory dependent nonlinearity typically arising due to material nonlinearity. So, uh, this is a more general class of problems. In formulating the uh, finite element formulations for uh, nonlinear problems, we uh, found that uh, we needed to introduce certain newer measures for strains and stresses. For example, if you use infinitesimal strains, uh, for a body under rigid body rotations, the strains would not be 0, uh, whereas we know that under rigid body rotations, the strain should be 0. So, a newer measures of strains are needed, uh, which satisfy two requirements, namely that rigid body motions imply 0 strains and for small strains, the infinitesimal strains uh, definitions are restored. Now, similar issues about stresses, uh, definition of stress measure also uh, were considered. The Cauchy stress tensor which deals with uh, deformed configuration, the force field and uh, area in a deformed configuration uh, was difficult to use in an analysis simply because we would not know uh, the deformed geometry when we developed the solution. So, uh, we developed uh, two alternative definitions for stresses that is Piola Kirchhoff, uh, first Piola Kirchhoff and second Piola Kirchhoff stress uh, tensors.
So to develop the uh, different measures of stress, uh, we interpreted stress as a measure which conjugates with a measure of strain to produce a uh, internal energy or as a quantity which produces a traction vector in conjunction with a normal vector defined with respect to a surface element. The principle of virtual displacements was used to formulate the problems and uh, the problem was if you use Cauchy stress tensor and uh, Eulerian strain tensor uh, which are defined both, both are defined with respect to deformed geometry, the, uh, the, we can set up the expression for the uh, virtual work. Uh, but the problem is, as I already said, the deformed geometry would not be known. So the volume over which we need to evaluate these integrals would not be known in advance. So what we do is therefore introduce suitable strain and stress measures that helps us to evaluate these integrals over uh, known configurations. So that is how we developed, uh, uh, you know, nonlinear problems. In nonlinear problems, we uh, recognize that if a structure is carrying a particular load uh, p we cannot apply the load, entire load in one stroke. So we divide the load uh, 0 to p into small increments and we trace the solution as the load is incremented by small amounts. During an increment of a load, uh, we can linearize certain uh, system behavior and that helped us to formulate the, uh, you know, complete finite element procedure to deal with these problems. So kinematically, we considered three types of approaches, the so-called total Lagrangian approach in which the base and reference configurations uh, coincide and the, um, this problem is solved with respect to the uh, configuration in the reference, uh, in the, with respect to the reference configuration. Whereas in updated Lagrangian approach, the reference con uh, configuration was updated as the loads were incremented and uh, the increment uh, between the uh, uh, reference configuration and current configurations were taken to be small. Uh, but the reference configuration itself was updated at every step. The, this we did not discuss although I briefly mentioned co-rotational formulation where we first form the co-rotated configuration that is the base configuration undergoes rigid body motions. This is exaggerated, this will not be so large, need not be so large, uh, actually CGs can coincide, would coincide here. The base configuration is used as a reference to measure rotations. Whereas co-rotated configuration is used as a reference to measure current stress of uh, stress and strains. Now we developed the total Lagrangian approach and updated Lagrangian approach based on which we formulated the, uh, you know, the virtual work. These are the virtual work principles, and we formulated the uh, structural matrices. So this is a kind of a gist of what we tried to achieve during the course. And in the towards the end of the last lecture, I also I briefly mentioned topics that could be. Uh, followed up as a uh, based on material covered in this course. What was not covered uh, in any, uh, uh, I mean we did not pay any attention was questions about material nonlinearity. So we should study, uh, you should study the uh, subject of plasticity and uh, um, pay more attention to formulation of constitutive laws uh, to be able to do this. Similarly in the questions about stability analysis we again did not consider uh, material nonlinearity. Now there are other topics about which I have briefly talked about. One is hybrid testing uh, among others Bayesian filtering etc. I would like to spend few minutes uh, explaining what is hybrid testing and what are the issues about uncertainty modeling and finite element method. <coughs> now how, what is the role that finite element models play in structural testing? Now there are different test, uh, you know, testing strategies available in vibration engineering. One is what is known as pseudo dynamic test uh, that typically helps us to handle questions about complicated inelastic behavior under dynamic loads using basically static methods of uh, experimental investigations. Then there is another one known as real time substructure testing. Uh, it deals with treatment of interacting primary and secondary systems in an vibrating environment. So these uh, techniques are being developed uh, uh, in the field of earthquake uh, engineering. Uh, so traditionally in earthquake engineering we, we have either a shake table on which we mount the structure to be tested and or we have a reaction wall based system where there are servo hydraulic actuators which apply dynamic loads on models like this. The shake table testing uh, the load time history that is earthquake load time history uh, is applied in real time 
the length of duration of the applied uh, acceleration is equal to the length of the observed earthquake signal. The problem with this approach is uh, limitations on payload capacity of shake tables. Uh, the best shake table that is currently available uh, may not be, you may not be able to test uh, say a building which is taller than say a 5 story building or study interaction between soil and structure or fluid and structure and issues like that. So um, there is a need to geometrically scale the test structures to, to be able to use shake tables. On the other hand, in effective force testing, uh, this limitation is uh, overcome to some extent, but still uh, the dimensions of the structure to be tested is governed by the dimension of the reaction wall system. Now in hybrid simulations what we do is, uh, we divide the test structure into an experimental part and a numerical part. And we try to avoid scaling either of time or of uh, geometry to the extent that is possible. So in a typical pseudo dynamic testing, suppose this is the test structure and these arrows represents actuators uh, and uh, this is schematically the actual hardware is shown here. This is a servo hydraulic actuator which is under computer control. Now the, we start by modeling this system as mx double dot plus cx dot plus r of x is equal to the applied ground motion. We treat that r of x which captures the inelastic behavior of the system as unknown. On the other hand, we assume that the inertial properties and damping properties of the system can be modeled computationally. So part of the structure namely inertia and damping properties are modeled computationally and part of the uh, structural model which captures stiffness properties is measured experimentally. The way the experiment, the experiment proceeds is we start integrating this equation with possibly a linearized uh, model for the stiffness and integrate from say 0 to delta t. That tells us uh, how the building has displaced x of t is a vector of different uh, you know nodal displacements and we apply those actu uh, uh, displacements on the structure. These actuators are under displacement control. And as a consequence of applying those displacements, there will be reactions that are set up in the actuators which we measure using load cell and that helps us to determine the stiffness. That value of stiffness is put into the equation of motion and the load is incremented uh, from delta t to 2 delta t and at every time the actuator displacement is determined by solving this equation and the stiffness is determined by actual measurement. Now this, these displacements were applied statically. So that is why this is called pseudo dynamic testing. So in this uh, approach the time is slowed down. A 30 second earthquake event can be expanded for 2 hours or 3 hours depending on the test duration that you are willing to uh, you know uh, your time that you are willing to expend on the testing. Now the question here from the perspective of this course is we have to integrate this equation of motion. We saw that even when stiffness was completely specified the, the question on how these errors grow was not very easy to answer. It, there were several questions on how to select the schemes of integration and so on and so forth. Now in this pseudo dynamic testing what happens is the errors due to uh, using finite step size and adopting certain integration schemes is compounded by errors due to experimental uh, you know errors in making measurements. So when we say that uh, we have to apply a displacement of say 2 mm, we may not be able to apply exactly that displacement, there will be an error. And when we measure the force transferred, uh, there will be again an error due to errors in measuring through the load cells. So all those errors also propagate. So the major challenge in this approach is of course how to combine finite element models part of uh, you know finite element model with uh, an experimental protocol and also how to deal with newer sources of errors in establishing this integration schemes. <coughs> the another uh, testing procedure uh, is known real time substructuring that can conceptually be explained like this. Suppose we have a two story frame we assume that part of the structure is uh, the behavior of part of the structure is understood well and a computational model is adequate for that. The remaining part has to be experimentally tested. Suppose we make a, a finite element model or a simple dynamic model, this will be a 2 degree of freedom system say. Now in this analysis, this part of the structure is treated as a numerical model and this part of the structure is treated as an experimental model, n is numerical, e is experimental. 
So, this resides on a finite element platform in our test protocol and this is a hardware only part of the structure is mounted on a reaction wall or a shake table. Now, we again start integrating the numerical model and while, uh, while doing this we need to know what is the reaction transferred by the uh, experimental component. So, there will be an iteration. So, we start integrating uh, we, may, we, st we move from say 0 to delta t and find out what is the displacement. We apply this displacement maybe a shake table in, in real time now it is not a pseudo time I mean it is not static and we measure the reaction transfer uh, to the supports on our shake table or reaction wall and that is transferred to the numerical model. So, the integration of equation of motion and dynamic testing of the experimental component take place hand in hand in real time. So, a 30 second event is uh, uh, you know analyzed in 30 seconds that means the speed of integration and uh, speed of um, testing must coincide. So, this again leads to several complicating questions and uh, uh, there are questions of time delays, noisy measurements and um, uh, issues like that which we need to implement while taking care of. So, these hybrid testing methods are uh, modern developments in earthquake engineering and there actually the finite element modeling need to uh, shake hands with experimental tools and there are lots of newer challenges uh, that one has to face. So, this is a brief introduction about hybrid simulations uh, as a uh, you know you can take off from what we discussed in this course and probably be able to address some of these issues. So, at this point we will close the discussion on this uh, this lecture as well as this course.